2020 was a year of changed plans. Whether it was because of the spread of COVID-19, the tumultuous elections in the United States, the numerous natural disasters that plagued many parts of the world, things did not go as expected this year. Trips were canceled, events rescheduled. In the business world, fortunes were made and lost for completely unpredictable reasons. Perhaps one of the biggest changes in the course of the business world this year was the decisive change in the course of Facebook's Libra project, which was announced in the middle of 2019. Libra's entrance into the global scene was made with the quote-unquote move fast and break things bravura that Facebook has become known for. The plan was to build a global financial system that could be used by everyone everywhere. However, things did not go as planned. Indeed, almost as soon as Libra appeared, a massive regulatory outcry began. As a result, nearly a year after Libra 1.0 was announced, Facebook announced Libra 2.0, a new plan for a more scaled-down, regulatory-friendly financial network. But the story is much more complicated and interesting than that. Recently, finance magnates went down the Libra rabbit hole with David Girard, who recently published Libra Shrugged, How Facebook Tried to Take Over the Money. The new book serves as a definitive volume on Libra's birth, growth, and the massive change in plans that Facebook was forced to make in order to preserve the project's life. David is known as a crypto skeptic, blockchain pundit, and the author of cryptocurrency and blockchain news site Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain. In 2017, David published his first book in the crypto space, dubbed Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, Bitcoin, Blockchain, Ethereum, and Smart Contracts. I'm Rachel McIntosh, and this is FMTV. David, um, first of all, I'm so glad to have you back on back on the show. It's been, I guess, about six months. We spoke right at the beginning of the pandemic. So, what has what has changed for you during that time? I finished the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, so, yeah, tell us more about that. So, um, I started this book last year because there were basically two stories in crypto in 2019. One was the Quadriga exchange collapsing, and the other was Facebook doing some coin thing called Libra. So I thought around October, I thought, oh, this is an interesting story. I'll just write something quick about it. I'll take a few weeks, it won't take too long. So it finally came out earlier this month, uh, as these things do. 2020 got in the way a bit, yeah, as yeah, it does. But it is out now. It is uh, lovely. I'm delighted with how it looks. I'm delighted with how it's written. And now, basically, my big quest is to let people know that the guy who wrote Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, <laughs> that marvelous international bestseller, has a new one out. Yes, yeah. Attack actually absolutely. did pretty well. I think I've sold like 11,000 all up, which is an amazing number for a self-published book. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. You're, so if you like the first one, you like the new one. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so where can we, where can we find the new one, first of all? So basically, um, you can get it through Amazon, obviously, they're doing the paperback. If you don't like Amazon, you can get the ebook at pretty much all the other ebook stores. Mm -hmm. If you search on David Gerard Libra Shrugged, you'll find the page which has a link to uh all the other bookstores and I'll send you the link afterwards. Okay, fabulous. So we'll be able, we'll, we'll be sure to, to point our, our listeners and readers in that direction. Um, before we really jump in, I, I'd like to know also a little bit more about you, David. Who are you? Me? Well, I was a, I'm a system administrator by day. I have a day job. Mm -hmm. um, but I also write and I do cryptocurrency journalism as basically it's about half a job, mm -hmm. uh, writing books and maintaining a news site, Attack of the 50 Foot Blockchain, which is the same name as my first book. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it was originally the book site, then I thought, I'll make it into a blog. And now it's got a few readers and that's quite good. And um, you can sponsor the blog as well through Patreon. <laughs> so that's nice. It, it, it's beer money, but it does help with expenses, you know. Absolutely. Doing corporate yeah. records, that's buying a, a netbook, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the other thing I'm doing is I'm trying to get books out more often than once every three years. So I'm Libra Shrugged. It's a weird little story because <laughs> um, it's like Facebook did this coin and it was a huge thing all over the news. And now, of course, then, of course, the, gov the, world, the governments of the world slapped it down. Because yeah. 
uh, which was quite amazing, just the ex the uniformity of the response. Like, right, right. Because Libra is amazing because it was started by, uh, it's not taken as seriously as I think it should be in the um, cryptocurrency world because Libra was started by four Bitcoiners. Um, they, and it has, it's full of Bitcoin ideas and blockchain world ideas. Um, all the amazing promises that people make about cryptocurrency, it'll solve inequality. You can do um, remittances with it and it'll bank the unbanked and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it was one and thing they I came did... up with a whole bunch of ideas that looked very like, sorry, you're saying? Oh, no, no, sorry. I was just saying that that was something I learned from you is actually uh, David Marcus is, is a big Bitcoiner. I didn't know. Yeah, that. he always has been. I mean, that's never been a secret, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big chunk in Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold about um, Marcus getting into Bitcoin in 2012. Mm -hmm. And he's mates with Wences Cazares from Zappo and stuff like that, you know. Um, he, he's very much, he's a Bitcoiner. He, he believes in the store of value narrative, the digital gold idea, but he thinks it's a really bad currency for transactions and using as actual currency. Otherwise he would have made Libra based on Bitcoin. And um, so they had to start their own. Um, so they like started with these Bitcoin ideas and then they put in a few ICO ideas, like let's have a, a token which you can buy to be an investor in Libra and let's swing around trillions of dollars of reserve and all the th sort of things you'd see written on ICO papers in 2017, you know. And the thing was though, this is Facebook and Facebook are huge right. and Facebook are important mm -hmm. and Facebook also are widely distrusted because mm -hmm. they misbehaved legally in so many ways. Um, and they've broken people's trust repeatedly, like when they were fined by the FTC in 2019 for breaking their 2011 settlement with the FTC on privacy, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so when David Marcus, now he always, he strikes me as a, comp as a completely sincere guy, right? If mm -hmm. David Marcus says, I think X, Y, Z, he probably thinks those things mm -hmm. and will act as though he does, right? I've read like 10, 15 years of stuff by and about him. So when he says that uh, Facebook's Novi wallet will not leak your personal information to the advertising engine, I don't doubt his sincerity. Mm -hmm. But when that Mark Zuckerberg says it, then based on predicting his future behavior from his past behavior, I really don't believe him. Right, right. You know, um, every chance he's ever had, he's, he breaks privacy and leaks information and then apologizes for it and does it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's um, absolutely consistent. So the blockchain team, I think, are sincere in their aims, but it is correct not to trust Facebook in the slightest. So therefore, when they brought this Libra scheme out with all these esoteric ideas that nobody understood, I mean, anyone from the crypto world would have looked at the Libra white paper and gone, I know that one, because it was all these Bitcoin world ideas, like bank the unbanked, distribute this token this way um, on a blockchain internationally, free of regulatory um, impediments. So, <laughs> it's, um, so regulators heard that and literally within minutes, minutes of minutes. the announcement, <laughs> um, Bruno Le Maire, the French finance minister, was being interviewed on radio at the time of the announcement. So they, they, they worked it into the interview. And he, of course, had an answer ready, which is, ah, this can't go ahead. No, they can't do a non-sovereign currency. No, <laughs> no, not happening. No, definitely not. No. Yeah. <laughs> and like after a few hours, Maxine Waters, um, chair of the House Committee on Banking and Finance, in the US said, no, no, not happening. Definitely not. Also, we want to really speak to you about this Libra plan of yours. <laughs> so about um, this Libra plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like in the book, I go through this, they basically, they'd worked on this idea all through early 2019. And you may recall, the news was leaking all over the place, you know, every right. time there was a morsel of information, it was all over the headlines, right? 
Uh, right about about Libra, of course. Yeah, um, Libra was huge news. Mm -hmm. So they um, basically decided, well, we'll go live. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> they hadn't finished their software. They hadn't finished their plan, their economic plan. Um, neither was actually done, and but they released them anyway. Said, this is our great new product, Libra. It'll be awesome. Now we want to talk to you about how we're going to make it work. And the regulators looked at their plans and went, you are not doing this. Mm -hmm. Because I go through this in a lot of detail in the book, but it wasn't just, it's okay if you're tiny and you're economically illiterate, you know. Um, right. ICOs that say, our oh, coin for bananas or dentistry will reach a cap of $2 trillion and take over the economy, you know. Yeah. Both banana coin and denture coin actually said that. <laughs> right yeah that's, that's those are actually real projects exactly <laughs> those are actually real things I, I didn't just say if you look in the book you'll see i've got a little footnote there which um where you can look up bananas dentistry the coins for them i actually i knew about denta coin but i didn't actually know about banana coin but thank it's, you for teaching me about banana coin. <laughs> it's great it was a token to um it was a token to make earn from um the earnings of a banana plantation okay but, um okay. yeah so it's like if you're tiny, regulators just nod and smile and go, that's nice, just don't break any laws. Mm -hmm. And then they break the laws and the SEC finds them. Uh, but yeah. when you're Facebook, and the thing was that Facebook has 2 billion users. What if all right. those people get into Libra? Because Facebook would like them in. Mm -hmm. They were thinking about a big plan from the beginning. Right. When Morgan Bella was telling everyone about this thing, she was like saying, how would you apply blockchain technology to a user base of 2 billion people? You know, they were thinking big. So this people have tried to work out how big Libra might get, you know, like in pay, not, not a lot of people in Europe keep their money sitting in a payment provider um, like PayPal or WeChat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Most in Europe, mostly people just use their current accounts in China. People keep a lot more money in, um, WeChat Pay or Alipay because it's convenient yeah. and it often serves as a bank substitute to that degree. So how big would Libra be? Um, so I guess is everyone's guess at the reserve was on the order of a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now that's a lot of money, <laughs> it turns okay. out. Mm -hmm. If you have that money just wandering around the world looking for somewhere to be invested, because you know the interest on that is supposed to pay for Libra, <coughs> pay for the system to run. Right. That will actually affect economies. And they um, basically, it was a sort of like a money market fund. The things which were so popular in 2008, like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. You may have heard of them. Good old Lehman Brothers, yeah. <laughs> yep. And um, they um, basically, money markets, money market funds were the idea was you would put your money with them they'd put them into super safe investments and you'd get a bit more money back out. So they were high quality investments, right? People treated them like super secure banks. Mm -hmm. It turns out they were not secure banks. Right. Um, and when, and some of the super secure investments they were investing in, what happened was, this is 2008 financial crisis. Um, some of the investments they were investing in, there was so much demand for these super safe investments that people tried creating new super safe investments. And mm -hmm. you can't really do that, it turns out. So um, they did super safe investments that turned out to be based on, say, um, mortgages. And then some <laughs> of those mortgages went bad. Mm -hmm. And this then led to the investments collapsing and the money market funds collapsing. And therefore, the people relying on the money market funds collapsing. And the Federal Reserve had to come in and bail out everyone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the whole financial system would have collapsed. So ever since 2008, the one thing that regulators fear is someone trying to do this again. Right. The one thing they fear is someone being that foolish a second time. So Facebook rocked up with their white papers, which basically had the same plan that led to the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. okay. regulators weren't happy with this <laughs> but this is bizarre you know because 
they have an economist, Christian Catalini. He's an academic economist, you know. Mm. Um, he, he's, he's not foolish. He's not uneducated. But he'd somehow missed that his plan was literally what caused the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all the regulation stuff, the only way when the blockchains are a better remittance channel is when you're not worrying about regulation at either end. Right. Because we know how to move numbers on a computer. Um, and Libra would have to be part of the financial system if it was going to work with real money. You know, they were happy with that because Marcus is a payments guy. He knows how to work with regulators, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, <laughs> It's bizarre. It's like they just did not do the reading or they did and they ignored it. I don't know which of those. This Maybe um, this move fast and break things sort of attitude combined with some good old fashioned, uh, you know, pseudo, -humani pseudo humanitarian uh, attitude that Facebook is known for. So I think that they're sincere in the way of, you know, our Bitcoiners are, they um, are very sincere about number go up and making money, but they also want think we can make, give everyone else financial freedom to be like us. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. they want people to, uh, they do want to bank the unbanked. And they think that if people use Bitcoins and the whole financial system runs on Bitcoins, that'll be the equivalent. The whole financial system can't run on Bitcoins, but you know, maybe they can, it can run on Denta coins or banana coins <laughs> or Libras. So, the big problem with Libra was basically that they had this massive, massive reserve of money that would destabilize whole economies, you know, like the 2008 crisis seriously affected the U S one of the biggest and healthiest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and how, what would it do to smaller ones? I think they had a plan to put the Singapore dollar into the Libra reserve at some point. Right, that's so like, like a, Singapore's a tiny country. Yeah, it's a tiny country. It's a tiny currency. Like the Singapore dollar is kept stable by two large sovereign wealth funds that add up to about six or seven hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like that's the whole reserve of the currency, not just the most stable, high quality um, government paper, but the whole economy, right. and. Um, the whole reserve, I mean, and Libra would be bigger than that. I mean, they'd just break it. What were they thinking? Why did they, why did they get out a calculator at any point? Well, what were they thinking? I mean, do you think that this was legitimately sort of an oversight or do you think that they were just sort of like, well, it's okay if the Libra overtakes, you know, such and such countries fiat currency, you know, so, part of what, what's going to happen? Um, this was a great fear, which is, it's like dollarization, which is the word for when a country's economy is overtaken by US dollars. Yeah. Sometimes this ha happens inadvertently. Sometimes it happens deliberately. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes like in Ecuador, dollarized in 2000, I think. Um, basically they had a hyperinflation and everyone started using dollars instead and the government went, fine, we'll just make the dollar the currency. So the Ecuadorian currency is now the US dollar. Right. Um, so the thing is that Libraization could happen the same way. And that would be quite bad because while the US dollar is maintained by the Federal Reserve for US interests, mm -hmm. um, they, they really do have to sort of, there's someone a government can talk to, mm -hmm. like even small government to large government, they can still talk to them. Right. And there is some sort of public service remit. And if the US abuses the power of the dollar, then people will not want dollars quite so much anymore. And so the US gets really quite a lot out of having the US, the dollar as the international currency. You know, mm -hmm. it's a massive, massive amount of power for the US. Right. So they they don't want to mess that up. Um, so Libra was actually thinking in terms of people using Libras instead of their local currency. David Marcus was talked about Argentina a lot because um, mm. he'd heard the tales of Argentina's currency is not good and it's not very secure economically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's fair enough, but you can't expect governments to really welcome that. Right. <laughs> and um, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's like when Bitcoiners say, oh, Bitcoin's huge in Venezuela. No, it's never been huge in Venezuela, you know. Mm -hmm. What they want in Venezuela is dollars. 
okay. That sort of thing. So um, Libra could have wiped out whole economies quite happily. Um, is, is that something that you think that, you know, the Libra creators, were they like, well, you know, this could happen, but we're okay with that? Or were they, you know, at least sort of pretending that that wasn't a possibility? Um. I don't see how they didn't see it coming. On the other hand, I don't see how they didn't realize they'd recreated the conditions for the 2008 financial crisis. Right. So I don't know. I okay. can't read their minds. Yeah. But um, they were definitely quite sanguine about the idea of, say, Libras taking over Argentina, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was always the example Marcus brought up. Right. Because, um, you know, uh, which I think he was told about by Mences Cazares who uh, is from Argentina and has some very strong opinions about how mismanaged Argentina is, mm -hmm. okay. which he will tell, which he will happily tell anyone. Mm. Um, you know, maybe he's right. I don't know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's like what ha has happened with Libra is central banks, of course, it stimulated them into thinking about doing central bank currencies again. Now that could be the one effect that Libra has that's a lasting effect in the world is it's got central bank currencies happening again. Um, they've done these before, but um, now a lot of hype has come in from blockchain, even if a lot of the implementations aren't going to be actually a blockchain. Mm -hmm. This used to be all hypothetical, right? Yeah. Whenever there's a new financial thing that comes along, central bank researchers have to think about it because mm -hmm. a central bank's job is stability, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they're public institutions. They, they think like public institutions with a responsibility, right? Their job is to keep their economy stable. Um, so if someone comes along with, say, e-money, electronic money for retail, that's a new and exciting thing in 1996. So um, the Bank of International Settlements did a long paper on all the possible ways this could go wrong. Yeah. It didn't go wrong in those ways. It was done carefully, and now money is basically blood, uh, done on computers. <laughs> so that was fine. Mm -hmm. But they thought about the possible risks first, because that's their job. If you look through the list of risks, it's very like the list of risks that central banks have thought about CBDCs. But it's also like the list of risks they thought about Libra. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that currencies being run by a private company, that's the sort of thing that just isn't going to work out very well because they will always have the temptation to um, do whatever makes them more money than what is in a public service remit because they haven't got one. Um, so central bank digital currencies, they're inspired by Libra, like China's DCEP, which is looking like it might go live sometime in the next year or so. Yeah. Um, yes. That's going to be huge if they get that up. Um, they were, they, that went from theoretical idea to project they had to deliver on when they saw that the Libra plan, they went, crikey, we'd better get this out there because they didn't want to get Libraized either. So, um, yeah. And so that'll be the interesting effect of Libra, I think, is going to be CBDCs. Now, whether people take on CBDCs, that's another question. Um, crypto sites talk about CBDC as if it's good news for Bitcoin. I'm pretty sure it isn't, but... Uh, mm, yeah. Because it needn't even be blockchain-based, you know. It's literally a central bank currency is just the central bank has the liability for the uh, money, which is the same as having cash, except it's electronic. That's It's literally just paper cash, except it's on... A computer. Yeah. So that question is a matter of who has the power in the banking system, who creates the money, commercial banks or the central bank. These days it's mostly commercial banks, that sort of thing. This isn't the sort of thing a consumer needs to think about, an end user. Right. If they ever think about it, they might think, well, the money's from the central bank, it's probably real. You know, it's good marketing. <laughs> but um, this, and this is something DCEP is discovering, that some um, in the latest trial, which I think happened last month, um, a lot of people used it because they gave away a whole pile of free money to people to use, and mm -hmm. they charged merchants zero fees for this test. And people went, well, it's fine, but it doesn't do anything that Alipay or WeChat Pay doesn't do. Right, it's basically exactly the same thing, you know, for the end user, like you were saying. Yep. You wave your phone, you spend your money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
the same as we do it in everywhere that has decent banking systems. Like Libra made a lot of promises that were like, just think when you can buy your coffee with a touch of a card, you know, um, or the touch of your phone. <laughs> just imagine the fabulous future when you can do that. Yeah. Now I'm in the UK and uh, you're in Finland. So oh, yeah. um, it, it's like, we have this. <laughs> yeah. It's like they look out the window in Silicon Valley and decided to build a worldwide system based on what was outside their office. Right. So what, so what about this, this whole thing about banking the unbanked, you know, both with Libra and also when it comes to central bank digital currencies, financial inclusivity is still something that's talked about. I mean, almost in every single sentence, <laughs> like it's like CBDC and financial inclusivity are always, you know, very closely together. You know, does that, does that, do you think that's going to really translate into reality? Well, the thing is that it's an easy question to state, but it's actually really hard to do in practice. Okay. Um, in the US, a lot of people don't have bank accounts because, so in a lot of other countries, in the UK, certainly in a lot of European countries, there are regulations that banks have to offer a basic no fees account. Uh -huh. Right. It's not much of an account, doesn't do much, but it is a bank account. It has a card hooked to it. Mm -hmm. And it is an account. It's electronic money like everyone else around you uses. You are now part of society functionally. The yeah. US doesn't have that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a way. In China, DCEP, they're hoping to reach a lot of areas that commercial banks haven't got to. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can. In Bermuda, the sand dollar. That one actually I really like. I cover that in the book. I read their white paper. I recommend people read the sand dollar white paper. It's a very sensible document because okay. it starts with the problem. It doesn't start with what could we do with the CBDC? It starts with, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. The problem they had was Bermuda is an archipelago of islands, right? Mm -hmm. On the outer islands, it's really hard for people to do banking because commercial banks don't set up a branch on some outer island with a lot of, with only a few poor people on it, you know? Yeah. So what can they do? So they started with their problem and they looked at the conditions, which is, well, we have, everyone has a phone. Even poor people have phones. Hmm. How's connectivity? Unreliable, but you can usually get through eventually. Let's do it this way. So they set up, they, they couldn't, normally central banks leave payment systems to the commercial banks because they're much better at dealing with customers. Mm -hmm. um, and but in this case, Bermuda's central bank pushed this ahead. They uh, set up a system which works on phones. You can interchange money directly between phones to a small certain amount. And then later you have to check in and it um, reconciles it. Um, mostly it's being run through the um, commercial banks and through the small money changes, the uh, small money changing shops which aren't quite banks, but are sort of very small scale financial institutions and they're quite common there. Yeah. So they put limited accounts with limited identity requirements. So couldn't be exploited. And um, so far it seems to be working out because they started with the problem, not with the solution. Like they didn't say, hmm, where can we jam a blockchain in? Oh, that'll be a good place. Right. No, they started with the actual problem they had and then tried to work out ways to solve it. And that's obviously the right way to, the right way around to do it, you know. Right, right. So It's so, one thing to come up with a cool thing. It's another thing to come up with a use for it. And the best <laughs> way to come up with a use for it is to have a problem and then reach the solution rather than the other way around. Yes. <laughs> Just think of that. <laughs> um. Yeah, there's there's one more thing, I, you know, another question I want to ask you is, you know, earlier when we were talking about dollarization and about yeah. how there was a risk of that happening with Libra, you know, as we're approaching this moment where it seems like at least more and more central banks are certainly showing major interest in developing CBDCs, um, do you think that there's, you know, potential that, for example, China's national digital currency is there, a, is there a way in which, you know, other countries, citizens of other countries could be incentivized to use that digital currency over their, over their own country's currency, you know, and could we see the same sort of 
you know, dollarization effect or run maybe ization effect happening through digital currencies? And is it in fact, you know, more or less likely that 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 kind of, you know, currency, I, I don't know, takeover kind of situation could happen with these CBDCs? It's a good question. Um, if they flow around like um, cryptos do, then yes, but they won't flow around like cryptos do. Okay. Because <laughs> um, the central banks are thinking very hard about that stuff um if there's a digital euro it'll work in so far as it makes payment systems better mm -hmm. um inside each european country the payment systems are actually usually pretty good mm -hmm. um remittances between countries money going between countries isn't as much as you might think um like citizens sending small amounts of money to each other yeah. It's like a few percent. So okay. it's not actually that huge a market, but it would be nice if everything worked better. Quite a lot of why the ECB talks about digital euros is they're sort of waving a stick at the commercial banks saying, come on, guys, get it together, build a payment system. You know, um, they much prefer commercial banks to build the payment systems because commercial banks are very used to dealing with hundreds of thousands of customers right. or millions of customers, whereas central banks have tens of hundreds of customers who they all know very very closely <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. um now things like dcep and the digital yuan um this is a threat that's often raised facebook love raising this threat by the way you've got to let us do libra or china will obliterate us yeah no one quite believes them or believes that libra would be wouldn't be just as bad you know yeah um, but yuan's just they're not very popular Mm -hmm. They're not popular internationally now. In fact, they're not that popular for large payments uh, inside China itself a lot of the time okay. um, or to, to and from Chinese vendors. So it's got a bit of an, it's not that hugely popular a currency. And so that would have to come first, I think. Whereas if you had a dollar coin that was actually federal reserve backed that would be vastly popular around the world because everyone wants dollars right so it potentially i mean the united states could for example have a lot to gain from from actually making a digital dollar but i mean what, what do you think we've seen some kind of blips of oh there's you know the words digital dollar have appeared briefly in the draft of a bill but we haven't really seen any meaningful progress towards that. But do you think that that's likely for the United States at some point in the future? Um, only if it serves a purpose. Okay. Like these appear, these notices appear as blips in bills because there is a Bitcoin lobby. Okay. Um, there are uh, legislators who really love blockchains and want to push them forward sometimes because they're getting lots of lobbying to do so sometimes because they know a lot about the tech um, stuff like that um, there's but i and the fed has done a lot of um research work like every central bank does mm -hmm. on what how these things might work but um there was a good talk which i mentioned in the book from lael brainerd um, who's one of the governors of the fed um, she pointed out that any system has to like show its, its usefulness. Mm -hmm. It's got to actually be useful to people. Um, use, the use case has to come first. Uh, the Fed is looking at putting in Fed now, which will be um, a sort of rapid real-time settlement system for um, banks, which will be very like faster payments in the UK or similar systems elsewhere in Europe, um, which will immediately like take the US to the next level. Mm. And when I say immediately, I mean immediately in three years. <laughs> immediately th in three years. And what do you mean by next level? Um, rather than having um, all this stuff which has to happen with um, three day delays or phone calls um, or everything being done with paper checks or whatever, right. it'll help make the payment system much more electronic and work a lot more smoothly. Right. Um, it's like discon. It, it's 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 surprising how um, back in the past a lot of things about U.S. consumer banking are. 
I think this is a lot of why people think that Bitcoin would be an improvement because frankly, anything would be an improvement, you know. Um, right. And why Libra put forward all these fabulous future plans that are literally what we've had over here for the last 10 years. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just an ignorance yeah. of the world. I, I could hardly believe that Libra did that. Have they ever left the house, you know? <laughs> David Marcus ran PayPal. PayPal's in hundreds of countries. <laughs> right, right. Well, I do have to say as an American who, who moved overseas that, you know, the, the <laughs> sending and receiving payments, you know, between countries almost instantly was like shocking to me, <laughs> you know? So how does it work? From your experience, what's the difference between America and um, Europe for you? I mean, and I, I, I will say it has changed quite a lot over the last, say, three or four years with the introduction of things like Venmo and Zelle and whatever else is happening, these third party yeah. solutions in the United States. But I mean, prior to that, I mean, I remember, you know, trying to send 50 bucks, you know, to my boyfriend or something like that. And we both had um, the same bank, you know, we both had, I think it was Bank of America and it took three days, you know, <laughs> to send one $50 payment from one person to another who had the same bank and, and no, no shade on Bank of America. I'm not trying to trash, trash talk them uh, at this moment, but, you know, just as an example. Yeah. Like in the UK, all I need is an account, is a bank number and an account number and I can send someone money in seconds. And that how long has thing. that been true? Hmm? How long has that been true for you? 10 years more. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, I, I, I don't, haven't checked when that first became possible, but it's been in place for a while. The faster payment service, right. the faster right. payment system. So yeah, it's like, an interesting thing with Zelle, which is Venmo and Zelle are basically workarounds for the uh, bank, slow payment systems in the US. Right, right. Zelle has been one thing that was adopted in Venezuela because they don't want cryptocurrencies, they want dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like the terms of service mean you're not allowed to use Zelle in, uh, in Venezuela, but they did anyway. <laughs> right, right. You know, they would accept US dollar cash or they'd accept Zelle dollars. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a digital dollar would be seized upon by anyone who get, who could get hold of the thing so and i bet they're thinking hard about that too like how do they stop sanctioned countries from using dollars it's a very tricky question right right, right. it's um so facebook is still trying to do libra or something called libra i don't know <laughs> what they'll end up with yeah it's um, quite, quite different now than than when it started yeah, basically the system they proposed is pretty much PayPal, but it's Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that could be fine because I can see that being a sensible business that's useful to the world, you know, because mm -hmm. a PayPal type system, but it's got Facebook scale. That's obviously a useful thing, you know. Right. Um, maybe people would take it up. Um, but I do see that just last month, a whole bunch of... Um, new rules came through from the Financial Stability Board proposing that the remittances plan would have to be delayed until like 2023 at least. Mm -hmm. So Libra couldn't do its international remittance plan until then it would be locked inside each country or inside each, uh -huh. or inside say the Eurozone or whatever. Right. Uh, it's, um, they're really, really cautious about private currencies. Um, Whenever a central bank or a government says stable coin, they mean Libra. So, and they're talking about Libra and they're talking about what if someone who'd actually read books and did their homework tried doing one of these? Yeah. You know, um, so, so now they're doing their hypothetical plans with a threat in mind. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> and, and desperately trying to accelerate systems. Right, right. I see as, as kind of competitors. So, I mean, do you think that you know, for example, stable coins that already exist that already are fairly widely used, like um, Tether or, you know, Circle Coin or anything like that. I mean, do you think that at any point regulators sort of were, I mean, obviously it's not the same scale as Libra, but do you think that this also kind of brought a new pressure onto those, uh, those, those coins? Um, so what I'm seeing in a lot of the documents is that they tend to mention Tether. Yeah. 
because it is the largest. So what we're talking about is not, Libra is supposed to be um, a consumer coin. It's supposed to be money that you use, currency that you use for shopping. Mm -hmm. Tether, USDC and stuff, they are for the crypto trading market. Yeah. They're a specialist financial instrument, really. Right. Not really money. They're mm -hmm. supposed to be worth a dollar, but they're not really dollars. They're, they're crypto trading tokens. Yeah. Um, and this is even without getting into the fantastic dodginess of is Tether backed by anything at all, you know, um, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is an open question. Um, it's, they're looking closely at Tether and they're looking closely at all these coins and you can bet stablecoin regulation will apply to these things because they're thinking about the money laundering angle. Yeah. Now, coins like USDC uh, is somewhat regulated. I know that Gemini are pulling out the stops with their coin, but not many people use it because mm -hmm. um, it turns out that regulation is not considered a feature in crypto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's... um. They're very interested in the use of Tether for money laundering. And I note um, that the US Attorney General published their, their documentation on how to tra track cyber crime. And one of their examples was laundering money by chain hopping, which North Korea actually did. And one of the intermediate steps was you change from Bitcoins to Ether mm -hmm. to Tether. Uh -huh. to Bitcoins. Okay. And um, that really stood out. <laughs> it was like, oh. <laughs> The big green letter T. Yep, yep, I know that one. <laughs> so yep. they're definitely keeping an eye on misuse of Tether. I don't think regulators care so much when it's just the crypto guys all killing each other, but they care a whole lot when, like, North Korea uses it. Yeah, exactly. So that would be an interesting, a North Korean stable coin. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I'm just imagining it. But I mean... It's, Libra is not really comparable to Tether. Libra, the closest existing thing I can think of would be Ripple XRP. But mm -hmm. XRP is mostly something that Ripple's positing as being used for banking and remittances. They very much want to be part of the banking system. Mm -hmm. And Libra wants to do that job too. But again, it's not a consumer currency. Um, Ripple really, really wants to work with the existing system in a way that Libra wasn't trying to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um libra 2.0 will happen i think it's still a risk to people because facebook want your personal information and also a lot of stuff about the libra plan they can't make it work without a digital identity system and having that run by a private company is questionable and having it run by facebook is extremely questionable because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if that became a more generally accepted digital identity standard even people who weren't using Libra would have to register with Facebook to be able to use money conveniently. And that would be right. quite bad. Right. So they haven't talked this up a lot. They haven't developed any code, but logically it's a necessary Libra system. And they have mentioned plans along these lines vaguely. Mm -hmm. So I would worry about that as a threat because basically everything Facebook does should be seen as a threat to privacy and personal information. And if you approach everything Facebook does thinking, how can this be used to violate my life and privacy? That's probably a sensible first approach. <laughs> I mean, I should point out, I'm still on Facebook because, you know, same reason everyone else is. It's where um, a lot of my friends are and the only place I can find them, you know. Yeah. Um, it's like the worst bar in town with horrible bounces, but it's the only place you can find your friends, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm still a frequent, if occasionally annoyed Facebook user. So I wonder, you know, just kind of maybe as sort of an aside about what your thoughts are about the future of Facebook as a company, because clearly it's something that so many people are so dissatisfied with. We have seen some migration away from Facebook, but still, you know, not enough to really make a meaningful dent in, in what Facebook is is in the world. What do you think about the future of Facebook? So Facebook's dealt with this threat before because anyone can go start a social network, right? Yeah. It's not like money. Anyone can go and start one. So Facebook was losing a lot of users to Instagram. So they went and bought Instagram. Uh huh. So you'd have to stop Facebook from buying other networks. Yeah. Um, you, there has been I don't know if this will come to anything. There's been noises and rumbling in US government about breaking up Facebook. Mm 
Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, a lot of legislators see Facebook as a fabulous American success story, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's really quite amazing. He built the network that everyone's on, you know. Like we yeah. thought MySpace was impressive, but it, that's nothing to Facebook. Yeah. But, um, it's um, so I think that making Facebook smaller would require stopping them from buying up competitors. Mm -hmm. Now, US competition tends to think in terms not of uh, ensuring competitiveness. The EU tends to go for ensuring competitiveness. The US just says, is it cheaper for consumers? Yeah. And that sort of breaks when your model is um, let users on for free and show them advertising and sell their personal information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a very long-winded way of saying I don't know, but it's an informed I don't know. <laughs> Think, yeah. A few things would have to change before anything really happened to Facebook, but those are the things that would have to change. You'd have to stop them from buying up competitors and there's you'd have there's talk of breaking up facebook and that would have to come to something i think yeah. there would have to be the political will to break up facebook or reduce facebook in a manner that seemed fair yeah right so david it's been so wonderful to talk to you i i want to ask you before we go uh so so i think uh you kind of earned a reputation in the bitcoin space <laughs> Uh, I still think Bitcoin is frankly terrible, but it's okay. endlessly amusing and interesting. So I okay, that's, that's what that. I was. I was like, has your attitude changed? You know, do you, after spending so much time researching you know, this technology and and all of these weird things that have happened over the last ten years, I mean, has that helped? You, are you is your heart warming towards blockchain or or Bitcoin or any any of the things that you've been worth researching at all? No. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It remains endlessly fascinating because the scammers stay the same, the attitude stays the same, the suckers stay the same, but the thing they're being sucked in with changes. Like it was oh. Bitcoin, then it was altcoins, then it was ICO scams. This year it's been DeFi. Mm -hmm. And DeFi is amazing because it was being pumped up by a lot of crypto venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. um, so, and a lot of this DeFi stuff was... I can't see how it would not fall afoul of the Howie test and be securities. Mm -hmm. But um, so that'll be interesting if the SEC ever wakes up. Yeah. But <laughs> some of it was really blatant. It was terrible. But um, <laughs> DeFi is falling out of favor because they are, they never quite broke out into the mainstream. Yeah. They managed to get articles in the proper financial press that talked about DeFi and this new risky instrument that said, and you can get 10%. And now, if you in real finance, if you say you can get 10%, that's amazing news. And that really catches people's interest. Right. Like, because interest rates have been really low. Investments are not paying off. The, this is even before the uh, pandemic. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, been really low. So if you offer 10%, that catches attention. Then you get further and they'll say 10%, you can get 100%, you know, Ponzi levels of payout. Right. Yeah. And it turns out, out that either this these were scams or they were if they weren't if they would did actually pay out then they were being they were using vc money to pump into it to um mm -hmm. make it happen and that isn't really paying off and they're calling to it and the hype is going down and you know it was an interesting few months <laughs> it was certainly quite a summer <laughs> it was it was it started so recently too is this, is this going to be the topic of your next book? Oh, God, no. I think the next <laughs> book will be, for the next book, I, I think I'll finally write the book about the ICO era. I was uh, hoping yeah. to do that as the next book, but this will definitely be the one. This is the one with, which has the working title, World's Worst ICOs. And I really can't call it that because no one who isn't in crypto will understand what the heck it's about. But yeah, uh, that's the working really title. Really and I think that... <laughs> Basically, I'm pretty sure that everyone in crypto would read a book called World's Worst ICOs by the guy who wrote Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain. I, 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 I have to agree. Because, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that crypto people, as much as people, crypto people hate having their own coin um, denigrated, there's nothing they love more than raining ordure on other people's coins. <laughs> yeah. 
I would I would gladly pay all of my banana coins for for a copy of that next book, David. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you know that there are no general bookstores that accept cryptos? None. Literally none. I was going to ask: Are will you be accepting cryptocurrency as payment for for some of these books? Sadly, not. <laughs> I would if I could. I actually tried in 2017 to sign up for Coinbase's merchant offering, the one where they take bitcoins and they send you actual money, but um. Yeah. That was during the upslope of the bubble and Coinbase had no customer service at that time because they were just mm -hmm. too busy dealing with um, all the lemmings signing up to get rich on Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. So um, and then they stopped that, then they dropped that offering in late 2017. So um, I haven't really bothered since. So I'm waiting for a general bookstore to accept cryptos. Maybe if... <laughs> Maybe if, maybe I can say, well, you know, go buy some Bitcoin on PayPal and then use PayPal to pay for it. Maybe you can do that next year. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, yeah, now that PayPal is in the game, you can start, you can really start getting your getting your cryptos, David, just like you always wanted. I'll get them just the way I always <laughs> wanted them in pounds. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, the book is out. It's available in. Um, Amazon and all the ebook stores, um, mm. Smashwords, Apple Books, all those. Um, the paperback is lovely. So I'm quite pleased. So tell all your friends. Yes, yeah, definitely. And, and David, I have to congratulate you again on this book. It's such an accomplishment. I know you put a massive amount of research and work into this. So well done. And, and thank you for, for creating this amazing resource this and a, a very entertaining resource may, may i add you're welcome <laughs> yeah, definitely okay um what was the what was your website again davidgerard.co.uk okay. but basically my search engine optimization game is absolutely brilliant by virtue of posting since 1995 so if you type david gerard libra you'll find me all right, 1995. Damn. Okay, David, thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. For news, events, and podcasts like this one, visit financemagnites.com. Thanks for listening.